Hope Church. Good morning. All right, we got a lot of things to go over here, but I'm going to start with a little personal story of mine that just happened to me. And sorry, I'm going to embarrass you, Tim. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, when I'm not working at the church, I drive a truck for a living. And I was down in uh, St. Helena on Friday, delivering a load of utility poles to this construction yard. And there's this guy down there, and we're getting all the poles and load and everything else. And we're just about getting ready to. I'm um, just about ready to leave, and he's like. Oh, I see you're from Oroville. I'm like, yeah. He goes, yeah, I live in Paradise. I'm like, oh, well, I go to church in Paradise. He goes, really? A CMA? And I said, no, a little, just a little church over on uh, Pence Road called Hope Christian. He goes, the pastor there, is he kind of short and kind of scruffy looking? It's like, that's Stan. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you know, some friends of ours have been telling us that we really need to come to your church. And then I just found out this morning that while me and Tim were having this conversation, his wife, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Barbara. Barbara was having a similar conversation with somebody else from our church. So when he told her about that, I guess they decided they really didn't have a choice. So they're here this morning. I just thought that was totally awesome. Welcome to our small church. 
We're small in size, but big in spirit. Just made that up off the top of my head. Pretty good, huh? Anyway, thanks. Okay, now for the other announcements. Let's see. The uh, Healing Hearts Conference. Ladies, if you haven't signed up yet, you need to get it done because if you sign up by the 8th, it includes your lunch. If you don't sign up by the 8th, I guess you have to beg and something. I don't know. They didn't put that part on the notes. But, yeah, you need to be here. You need to sign up by the 8th. That way your admittance will uh, include your lunch. So there's more details on all these things, by the way, in your bulletin. Uh, the archery lessons that uh, Joe Becker's putting on this Saturday, 11 to 3 for beginners. No charge. All you got to do is show up. It's an introductory lesson, and then it'll go on from there depending on what you want to do. Uh, we have a spaghetti feed coming up um, to raise money for the rental of the Performing Arts Center for Studio C Spring Performance, which includes Hope's own McKenna Wise from 6 to 8. Um, it's going to be here. Uh, tickets are $10 for adults, $5 for kids. Three and under get to eat for free. Wow. I, got, I had a grandson when he was three. They'd put him out. <laughs> he could eat a lot. Anyways, um, so that's going to be right here at the church. We're going to let them use the church. They're, they're raising funds. Again, more information in your bulletin. Uh, let's see. The Life Recovery Bible Study that Jim is doing started, started last night. And it's going to be every week right here, 6 p.m. Right, Jim? Okay. I wrote it down right. Good. Okay. Um, we have a youth ministry. Um, Will and Nate, wherever he's hiding, are in charge of that. And it's really, really growing. Um, if you know anybody who'd like to attend, talk to Will. Talk to Nate. Get some more information about it. And then we have this other little thing coming up called Rock the Ridge. For those of you who don't don't know what it is, it's a six hour long free concert, free food, games for the kids. We raise money for a good charity on the ridge. This year we're raising money for the veterans on the ridge, which is one of the greatest causes because those guys give a lot for us and we like to give back when we can. And speaking of that, uh, my wife Linda, who is kind of the um, person who took the chaos that is organizing this and kind of organized it. Uh, I was going to say a few words about it. We have a lot of newcomers in here that don't know me, and everybody says, well, go see Linda. So I wanted everybody to know that if you have any questions, um, come see me. If I don't have the answer, I will make sure that I can get it to the appropriate person. It is a fun, fun thing to do, and we benefit the veterans this time, and it's just a beautiful thing. We have a lot of fun. We have sign-ups out in the hallway. Please sign up. They're set in a couple uh, two-hour increments, so you're not stuck there all day on one event. And just come and enjoy, and if you have any friends, invite them. So please, um, if you have any questions, just come see me. I'm usually in my little corner back there um, most of the day. I'm here all time, uh, both services. Thanks. Okay, and I don't know if she said this part. There are sign-up sheets out there. Look them over, see what you'd like to do. It's a lot of fun. It's really a blessing to participate. You get to meet a lot of people. Um, it's a blast. Okay. Um, there was something else. And I forgot. Oh, yeah, there's some football game or something like that and Stan was up here speaking earlier about it I don't understand the football thing um, yeah that, that that's the guy and uh, anyways well he was comparing it to to our lives because as Christians not only are we in the Super Bowl every day but we get to win the Super Bowl every day and isn't that just totally cool so um, get up and uh, greet somebody everybody go over there and mob Tim and welcome him to the church because he hasn't been here before and, uh, oh, uh, go Ravens. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. Um, I can't say the other one because it's against my personal beliefs, but there's another team playing that some people want to win.
friend of mine years ago who uh, built me a uh, custom guitar and um, it was a flying V and it was a twin to this one and uh, I quit playing music sold everything including that guitar and uh, I um, went to his memorial service when he passed away and the guitar that he built for me was on this podium and I felt like dirt because it was gone. And um, so I didn't say anything during the service. Uh, a lot of people talked, talked about what, what he did, uh, basically helping him about his guitar, but about their guitars, fixing them for him and stuff. And he was, there was so much more to him than, than, uh, than music. Uh, his name was Bill Delancey. And... Uh, This is my opportunity to say what I wanted to say then about, about him. And um, not everyone gets a chance to kind of like do a do-over. And this is my do-over. Um, so in, in uh, about three weeks ago, I was asked to play a guitar for a person here at the church. And uh, she said that her son had built it. and. Um, She'd never heard it before, so uh, I said, I'd, I would love to, I'd be honored, what's, what's his name? And, and she said, Bill Delancey, and oh my gosh, the memories. So I've been uh, thinking all week, what to, what to play, what to play? And all these songs come through my head, and all of them are real sappy, and they make everybody cry. And, and um, because it's from the heart. It's not just because that's what I want to see happen. And I thought, gosh, Bill, what, what would you do if you were here? And he'd say, man, play the guitar. Just play it. Play it for all it's worth. So I want to thank Carol Hansford. <clears throat> I 
trouble I wish wasn't there And I have asked a thousand ways That you would take my pain away That you would take my pain away I am trying to understand Straight the past that crooked lie. Oh Lord, before these feet of mine. Oh Lord, before these feet of mine. When my world is shaking, heaven stands. When my that we get to know God, the more we love him. The more we learn about who God is and what he's done for us, the greater our love grows. He created us and gave us life. Though we fall short and don't measure up, he sent his son to save us. One day, we will be with him forever because he sent Jesus to pay the price for our eternal life. As we take communion, let's remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. before me I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel Will I dance for you Jesus Oh and all you be still Will I stand in your presence to my knees will I fall, will I sing 
Friends don't let friends play untuned guitars.
Church, second service. You glad to be here today? Yeah, yeah it's good to see you. And we welcome you. Also, if you're uh, watching online, we welcome you. If you're on your smartphone or PC or whatever, thanks for joining us also on our live feed. And I want to wish everybody a happy Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, yeah, I see some smiling faces. Some of you may be like my wife. That she's glad the Super Bowl's here because it's the last game of the year or the season. Uh, but she's been a good camper. You know, she's hung in there with us. But, uh, and I hope you have a great day today and, and celebrate. Uh, root for the team of your choice, the Niners. And uh, have a great day. Uh, but we're here for something greater than a, a game. Amen? We're here to, right now to worship God. And, but I do want to use a couple of football analogies. Um, one is when you play uh, football, one of the most important things is they teach you to get off on the ball. As soon as the ball snaps, the quicker you get off on the ball to hit your opponent, the, the better you're going to do. If you're slow, you're going to get knocked back. So you've got you to get off on the ball right. And uh, we've been in this series uh, studying around this verse that's on the back of your bulletin where Jesus has asked, what's the most important commandment of all the commandments imagine you're teaching and you have these smart people around you but they've kind of got a sour disposition and they're always trying to catch you make a mistake i mean and these are the experts of the culture and uh they're putting him to the test well that's what they're doing in this matthew context and they say what's the most important commandment and he gives this answer that you have on your outline jesus said to him you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And we said as we've entered this new year, we want to get off on the ball right. We want to begin the year right. So we want to make the main thing the main thing, focused on what Jesus says is the most important thing in the Torah, in the law, and hundreds of commandments. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Second analogy is uh, in football, I coached it four years and played it six years. And uh, one of the things, I coached the uh, little guys in JV. Some of them, it was the first time they ever played. And one of the things you had to teach them was to bring it, to bring it all, to bring it all. Because if you bring just part of it, you have more of a chance of getting hurt. Sometimes uh, a guy will kind of hold back because he doesn't want to get hurt, and you have more of a chance of getting hurt, actually, if you hold back. you got to bring it. And I would say to them, you're being told by your mom what to do, and you're being told by your teacher what to do, and you're being told what your Sunday school teacher tells you to do and I want you to do what your mom tells you to do and do what your teacher tells you to do and do what your Sunday school teachers do but when you get out here on the field I want you to become violent because all those other sports are exercise football is a collision sport and you have more of a chance uh, doing well if you bring it all in fact sometimes guys really big burly guys that were blessed with a great natural body had a harder time bringing it all. They were more timid. And sometimes little guys, you know, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Sometimes little guys would bring it and be incredible hitters, so you never know. With Jesus, Jesus never said, bring part of yourself to God. He didn't say, love God with part of yourself. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And we've been looking at that first part uh, of this, in this series. And next week, we'll go to the part where it starts talking about loving your neighbor and loving people. And we'll look at examples of how Jesus loved people and teaches us to love people. But today, I want to ask you to consider giving up your soul, to give your soul, to bring all of your soul, to not compartmentalize. There's kind of this fear, I think, sometimes of risk. You know, I read an article that said after you turn 50, people tend to want to take risk less. We want to be comfortable. Uh, we don't want to be stressed. And the article was making the point that psychologically uh, and physically, it's actually more healthy to continue to take risks. And the article said that sometimes people get afraid of risk and take the comfortable way, and then they get bored, and they start taking habits that are self-destructive because they're bored, and they're literally bored to death. And you know, Jesus never said, take it easy, hold back, be cautious. He, he was not risk averse. He said, bring it. Bring it all. Bring it all. Don't hold back any area. Give it all to God. And I really think that sometimes we think, because we have even a struggle going on in our life, that, well, I don't want to talk to God about this struggle because I don't want to bug him, you know. I'll get it right, or I'm blown in this area. I'll, talk, I'll praise him at church, and, oh, but i got to get... But that, to me, that's like, um, um, like you, uh, you that are parents, if you know your kid is hurting over something, and they don't want to tell you because they don't want to upset you or whatever or bother you, that would just break your heart, right? They, you, want, you love them, whether they're doing well or not, or they're struggling or not. And God is that way. And Satan, I think, tries to trick us into, well, hold back certain parts. But Jesus says, love God with all your heart and all your soul. Now, i got to tell you, this study this week really challenged my socks off, studying about the soul and what is the soul. And I'm not going to do it justice in this short amount of time. I'm hoping to pique some interest in you, and you'll study it more fully. The first point, though, is there is more to me than meets the eye. There's more to me than meets the eye. If you're a note taker, fill that in. There's more to you than meets the eye. There is the physical part, of course, but you also have a soul and you have a spirit. The Bible says, here's a, here's a verse that's not on your outline. I'm going to give you a few uh, extra verses today. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, uh, Paul talks about God sanctifying. That means setting apart us. And he says, our soul, body, and spirit, threefold. And it's hard to differentiate. Well, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit, biblically? There's a verse, another verse you can write down, Hebrews 4. 12 and 13, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 talks about the Word of God, that it's living, it's active, it's powerful, it's not a dead letter, it's, and it says it's like a two-edged sword, it cuts both ways, and it's able to discern between soul and spirit. There's like this 
it's like God's MRI where he can see in our soul tissue and our spirit and, and he can differentiate and see where we're at and nothing is hidden before him, it says. In Genesis 2, 7, I have on your outline, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. You have a word that's used for life, sometimes for soul. It even mentions the blood sometimes. The word in the Hebrew is nephesh. Everybody say nephesh. Nephesh uh, is used in different ways. And then there's a Greek word called suke. Say suke. Suki, suki, su. Suke is uh, uh, the Greek word for the same thing. And you have a, typically you have the original Old Testament in Hebrew, the original New Testament in Greek. But then they have this one called the Septuagint that was produced where they wrote the whole, for Greek people, uh, uh, language, they wrote the whole Old and New Testament in Greek. And they use suke when they talk about the soul. Now, this is, uh, uh, there's a reason I'm saying all that. If you, I'm going to give you another verse because I'm going to give you a little side note and I want you to check it out and see what you think in your study. If you look at Genesis 1 where it's talking about creation, it says uh, down at the end of the chapter, it's describing God creating everything. And uh, then it says, um, verse 29, Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of what? Life, uh, nephesh. Everything that has nephesh in it. I give every green plant for food and it was so. And God saw it, all that he made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. I believe animals have souls because he says he gave everything that moves about on the earth nephesh now uh, he doesn't say that about plants they're living organisms but he doesn't say they have a soul so you check it out on your own that's your homework this week class see if you agree with me that animals have a soul so we're going to dig more into well, what is the soul because it's confusing uh, there's more to you that meets the eye is point number one. God made you a living being, and we tend to focus more on the physical part, or we're tempted to, because that's what we see, and it's tangible, and we have senses we hear, and we, we smell and taste, so we get focused sometimes on that. And then we live in a world that sometimes doesn't, it's anti-spiritual, uh, spiritual things, and so it's all about how you look and what your net worth is and, and all that kind of stuff. But there's more to you that meets the eye. And the question is, will you give it all up? Will you give it all up today? Number two, my soul is my will. My soul is my will. Think about this. Um, when, you, when you study the word nephesh or suke, it is the person, the personhood of a person. It's their will. It's their personality. It's the seed of their emotions. It's all of you. It's who you are. When you leave the shell, you're still going to live on. Your eternal soul will live forever. Sometimes uh, you, maybe you've been where, where someone died and something happened. They left that shell. They're gone. They were there just a moment, but it wasn't all physical because the physical remains behind and it's still there, but it's done. And the Bible teaches, here's another verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 and 45. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 and 45. He, Paul talks about an Adam, the first Adam, which is in Genesis, and then he calls Christ the second Adam, and he says the first Adam had a natural body. Through him, we inherited from our great-great-great-great-grandpa Adam a natural body, a physical body, and then through Christ, we are quickened. We get a spirit, an everlasting spirit through the resurrection. He's talking about the resurrection in the chapter, the power of he overcame death. So you have a spirit that's going to live forever. Your shell can get tired and worn out. In fact, I've noticed the older I get, it's easier it gets to where it hurts sometimes. In fact, the more I try to exercise, the more it hurts. Has anybody ever noticed that? <laughs> if I don't do anything, I just sit in my chair, I don't really have any aches and pains so much. I gotta put my knee up. The moment I start working out, my body's like, this is not good for you. This is, I know intellectually it is, and I gotta do it, and I need to, to, to live, but sure hurts. The, the, this thing is temporary. It wears out in time. It's just a shell, and we need to use it to the glory of God and take the best care we can 
but there's more to you than meets the eye. And inside of you, there's you, the real you, that's, that, that your will, your desire, your emotions, your personality. Now look at these verses where nephesh is used, the, the word for soul. Genesis 34, 8. But Hamar spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. This person, this was actually an inner, uh, it was uh, another people other than Israel that uh, the guys wanted the daughter of Jacob. And this wasn't right because God wanted his people to just have this relationship with them in the Old Testament because he was bringing through them someone to bless all nations. Who was he bringing? Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. It wasn't that God didn't like certain races, but the world had gotten so far away from God. I, I had a Hebrew professor once up in uh, Seattle, and, I, and one of the students said, why would a loving God tell Joshua and all of them to go out there and wipe all these people out? And the professor said, there are some things worse than dying. And people had gotten so far from God. In the original uh, beginning, in the garden, God wanted to have a relationship and be their God, and, and they would be his people, but then they, they gave into sin in the fall, and so the, th the place got worse and worse, and there were a multitude of gods, so God's kind of cleaning house, and he's raising up Israel. With Israel, he shows us the grace of God. Some don't see the grace in the Old Testament, and I beg to differ. The more you read it, you will see God wooing his bride, going after her. There's romance. There's love. He, he loves her. He gets angry. He, he wants her so much. And then the New Testament, he, through Messiah, he brings grace because the problem about the old law is we can't keep it. The problem isn't the law. The problem is us, right? So God wanted to keep them, this people. So here's this guy. I'm really getting off the subject. Let's get back to Saul. Here's this guy who's not an Israelite. He really, really, really wants this woman in his soul. You can want someone so deep down in your soul. You, he, he, he longed for her. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against the soul. Suke. We have a world where we're human beings and we have temptations and we're tempted and we have struggles with those, with those temptations. Is sin fun ever? It's never, sin is never fun? I'm not saying is it ever good. Depends on how you define good, but is it? <laughs> sin, if sin wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. There's a verse in Hebrews where it says that Moses, someone messed this one up. Moses uh, refu chose the ill treatment of the people of God rather than enjoy the, the pleasures of sin. I think it says short, or it has the temporary idea to it. That, you know, he chose something that was enduring and lasting. Like we are tempted to do something, and it can hurt. If God says not to do it, that means it usually it hurts us or hurts other people. I love when Joseph sinned. He said he couldn't sin. He says, how could I sin against God? Ultimately, we sin against God, our Father. And uh, so we're in this world of sin, and we're trying to live a certain way to bring glory to God. And our soul can get heavy. Our soul can get... He, Peter uses the word like warfare. We're in this war. Now then there's also a fallen world where they don't care about God at all. They don't want to hear about God. And they have the total different core values. And a lot of times it's all about here and all about now in the whole physical realm and not the suke or not, not what's best for your nephesh, for your soul. So your soul can get burdened. You ever feel your soul being heavy? That's because you're in a war that's being waged against your soul. Look at Proverbs 25, 25. Like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. You ever been out like working outside in the heat of the summer and you're so thirsty and you finally get some cold water? That's what good news is for the soul. See, your soul needs to hear good news. And of course, the gospel of Christ is the best news of all. And this God who's crazy about you and wants to take you on this journey, yes, it's risky, and yes, it's dangerous, and yes, you're, there's uncertainty, but you're on this journey with him. And uh, he, wants to, he, he wants to take you through the good news of this exciting life. And that's why I think we need to encourage each other in the body and in our relationships, because our souls need good news. 
in, in, inside of you, deep down in you. Look at this verse from Psalm 103, 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. All that is in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, nephesh, and forget none of his benefits. I, I use the New American Version on here because I like the original word can be translated um, praise the Lord, O my soul, which is good too. We, we praise the Lord. But I think sometimes we, we don't realize we bless the Lord. You know that? You bless the Lord, and I can bless the Lord. We think about him blessing us, and he does. But when our soul, we give up our soul to him. Bless the Lord, O my soul. We bless God. And then he says, forget not his benefits. Thinking of his benefits, like we talked about, love God with all your mind, helps us give it up, give it all up to bless the Lord. Remember that song? As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. You alone may my spirit yield. You alone my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver. Only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You're my friend and you're my brother, even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. The thing that's awesome is when we get afraid, we reserve, we hold back, well, I'm going to be missing out or whatever. We're not going to miss out. And the more we love God, it's not going to hurt our other relationships. It's going to help them. It's only going to hurt if it's a relationship that doesn't want to love God or tries to prevent you to love God. But typically, it's going to help you and me to love other people. We're not going to neglect others if we if we worship God. It's going to help us to be whole, and it's going to help us in our soul. Point number three, I need God's help to love him with all my soul. I need God's, I need God's help to love him with all my soul. And that would go the same with uh, to love God with all your mind and to love God with all your um, heart. God is so awesome that he helps us in this process because we're fallen and we fall short but the more we get to know God, we come into this relationship with him where we're saved, we're brought, our soul is right with him, and he's our father. Then we grow in our love toward him. Do any of you ever have a relationship, have ever had a relationship that has grown over time? The love has grown? Yeah. Do you think your love can grow for God? Yeah. See, there's this excitement when we're baby Christians and we first get to know God and we're, I mean, I'm, I'm forgiven, you know, all my sins, and his Holy Spirit's in me, and I have future, and I'm going to heaven, and it's, it's exciting and good news, but there's a love that comes from journeying with God through trials and ups and downs that's a deeper love that you can't get on a quickie. It's a, it's a constant, enduring, growing love, and God helps you in the process. He, he puts... He puts his spirit in us when we're, when we're brought to Christ and we put our faith and he helps us. I want to read to you from 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. This is Peter writing to people, Christians that are scattered throughout, and they're going through persecution and they're going through difficulty, hard times, and he doesn't say, oh, poor you. That's why sometimes people want the pastor to just, oh, poor you, let me hold your hand. You know what? Jesus didn't always do that. God, God doesn't always say, oh, poor you, because he knows I don't, uh, usually don't need a pity party, because when I have a pity party, uh, things suck. So what he does say is, think about what you have. Don't think about what you don't have. Think about what you have. And it says, uh, praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a what? A new birth. Did you know you get a do-over in Christ? You got a brand new life. And then he says, into a suke, living hope. A hope that's not dead, it's alive. You have a living hope. And then he says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, Jesus overcame death. He proved he has the power. He is God. He's more powerful. And it proves that your new hope is alive, and your, your new birth is alive, and you're going to live forevermore. And then he says... And, and into an inheritance. Did you know, believers, you have an inheritance? Some of you are still trying that lottery, and you got something so much better. If you want to keep doing the lottery, that's okay. Just give some of that to the church. But you have an inheritance. Notice the inheritance you have in Christ. 
It says, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you. You've got reservations. It's kept, and it's something that cannot spoil, cannot fade. See, that's why it's uh, silly for me to get all worried, spend my whole life on just on stuff that's going to rust or fade and not have the whole God in there and the soul thing and the unseen realm, because that's all temporary. You have something reserved for you. And then it says, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So you through faith are shielded by God. God helps you because of your faith. You know, God is the only God in history, I mean, of, of little gods of other religions. Jesus, Christianity is the only faith where God says, I want you to have faith in what I've done. All the other ones say, focus on what you do, look what we do, and run on this treadmill and jump these hoops, and if you get good enough, you can reach this nirvana, or you can get to this certain point, or keep dying and being born again, and maybe you'll come back as a grasshopper, or you'll keep coming back until you get better and better, and some kind of, God's the only one who says, I want you to have faith in what I've done. Just believe what I've done at the cross and in the resurrection. And then you do as an outgrowth that you're already right with God. Your doing isn't to get right with God. Amen? Get it? Good. <laughs> Let's do that again. Get it? Good. So God is so awesome that we put faith in him. He shields us. And then he says, in, these, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have hard, have had, excuse me, to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I don't think God brings evil on you, but he lets you go through trials so that your faith, which is more precious than anything Tiffany's can produce, you got a faith that is so precious to God, you're trusting in him, and, and you go through those trials, and then he says, though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with it, I love this, inexpressible and glorious joy. He says, you get this joy that's inexpressible. There's no words to describe it that comes. And then he says, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your what? Souls. Souls. Nefesh, suke, the salvation of the real you. There's more to you that meets the eye. There's the, the will, the personhood, the, the, the who you are inside. It's going to live forever, and you can love God with all your soul, and he's even going to help you in the process. Now, remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Remember that one? Everybody's heard that beautiful, beautiful passage. Verse 3, it says, he restores my soul. It says uh, in IV, I think, refreshes my soul. He doesn't want to do a quick fix outward thing. He wants to touch you deep, deep down within to your deepest core of who you are. Matthew 11, I want to put this up here. Matthew 11, 28. Jesus said, come to me, all you. He doesn't say certain ones who can achieve this certain thing. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Three words there I highlighted because they're show action words where he says, come, take, learn. Come after not just an outline or a church or a thing. Come after a person. Come after Jesus, the Messiah. Follow him and take his yoke. Traditionally, a lot of times I've heard and I've taught that, that about the yoke, like where you have two oxen and you can hook them together and they actually pull more together than one can individually and we need to be yoked with Jesus. But you know what? As I've dug around in the last several years, I've found that in the, the rabbinical 
spot, the rabbi had a yoke. Every rabbi had his own yoke. That was his body of teaching and his way of life. If you came to follow a rabbi, you were going to try to be like your rabbi. That's why Jesus talked about how a disciple is not above his master, but when he's complete, he will be like him. Jesus says, you got all these Pharisees and Sadducees and these hypocrites that are putting pressure on you and guilt tripping you and, and, and neglecting hurting people, but you need to just come to me. Come to me and take my yoke because my yoke's different. See, Jesus' goal in your life is not to put you on a treadmill and wear you out for Jesus. He wants to bless you with an abundant life. And look what he says you will find when you learn from him. Rest for your soul. Soul rest. Now, I'm going to quit preaching and start meddling. In an audience this size, there's probably somebody here today, and you are burdened in your soul. And it's time for you to offload that. Time for you to come to the Messiah. It's what he said. I didn't say it. He said it. If you and I, all you, all you who are weary and burdened, come to Jesus and offload it on him. I'm not carrying this burden anymore. I mean, it's just not easy in this world. And it may be something from your past. It may be something you're in the middle of right now. It may be something in the future. And your soul is all burdened down. Today's the day for you to give it up. Just give it up. Say, take, take this away. Oh, but that's risky. Yeah, just give it up. God is risky. God's not a wimp, man. He says, bring it. Bring it. He didn't want to bore you to death. He, he wants to get you out of your comfort zone. Just give him whatever it is. But what if I blow it later? Oh, you will. We all do. What do you do? You go back to the Lord, and he restores my soul. Nefesh. He gets deep down in my heart, in my core. But I've lived years as a hard and mean person. That doesn't matter. They all come at different times. Jesus taught about that. People come at different times, and the master has a right to decide who he saves and who's right and who's going to the celebration. You just come. Well, my faith isn't real strong. That's all right. You, need, you got a little faith in a great big God. You need to come and take his yoke and learn from him and quit carrying that burden around because he wants to give you soul rest. Number four. My soul is worth more than all the world. And that means your soul. Everybody's soul is worth more than all the world. Yeah, but I did this or did that. It doesn't matter. You have a precious soul, precious to God. So much, like Gina said, that God sent his son to redeem us, to reconcile, to, to, to bring us a new life. And, and God is crazy about your soul. He loves you more than your looks. He loves you more than... Uh, he doesn't want to manipulate you or guilt trip you or use you, conquer you. He loves you. And, and Jesus taught this to the people, to the disciples, and it's passed down to us in the New Testament. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? See, we can sell out for lesser things and lose our soul. See, this is why I like being involved in the church, and I was drawn to try to be in ministry. Is like, I, from what I understand from Jesus, we are doing the most incredible thing that can be done by helping souls. You know that? We're helping souls. I, I, I was thinking about this this week, and I thought of that Loretta Lynn song, I'm a, I'm a coal miner's daughter. I'm a soul miner. I, wrote, I text my daughters, you are soul miner's daughters. You know, every time we help someone, uh, and God through us, not because we're all awesome, but God working through us, and we are helping someone that's a soul. And I keep hearing stories of people being reconciled or people working through difficulty, family uh, challenges, uh, souls that are brought back together. God's in the soul business. I know we talk about soul food, you know, and uh, that, that artist has soul. You know what? You have soul. Look at your neighbor and say, you got a soul. Everybody has a soul. And soul is everlasting. Your soul is going to live forever and ever. And God came after your soul, and he came after my soul. Then in the church, we get to pass it on and bless other people. Jason Witten was awarded by the NFL Man of the Year. Great big uh, tight end guy, great guy. And I, I didn't know this, but he does a ton of work. And, and he works with, uh, as, with the big brothers, big sisters. He works with all kinds of nonprofits to help families and children and they played a video before they gave him the award and it showed him he he said when he was little him and his he had two siblings i think it was his mom left an abusive man 
and it was tough times, but she took him uh, to live by his grandfather. And he said his grandfather would uh, drive him to school every day, and he would talk to him, and he said, I, I had an abusive dad, but my grandfather, he taught me how to be a man. And he taught me that life is about helping other people. And he said, and they showed a picture of him and his wife and his kids, and he says, you know what, now in, I am changing the cycle in my family because I have a good relationship with my wife and with my kids, and my grandpa helped me to have that. His grandpa changed his soul through the power of God. You and I can influence one another's soul. We can lift each other's soul, and ultimately, of course, we've got to come to Christ for, for that soul rest. We can really make a difference. We are like salt and light. You take away uh, the soul from the body, you have a decaying carcass. You take away Christians, Jesus that is, the Christ and Christians from the world, you have the kingdom of rot. That's what we, why he calls us the light. So the challenge, I put challenge on your bulletin because I misspelled it. <laughs> I thought about saying, this is a Greek word for challenge, but I don't know if you be right. Uh, so... The challenge is, will I give my soul to God? Am I going to give it all up, or am I going to reserve it and hold back? That's miserable. That's boring to hold back. Yeah, but what if this happens, or what if that What if I get hurt? You will, you will. Those of you who've been falling for a while, bonsai, you know. You get beat up. We're at warfare in this world, but you keep giving it up, keep giving it up, and you get refreshed by God, not by man, not by your performance, refreshed by God, refreshed by God. And, and the, soul is, the challenge is to not hold back your soul. In Luke 12, Jesus told the story about this guy who was full of covetousness and he just cared about things. And he says, I've got so many things, I'm going to build bigger barns. And he did a building project and he built bigger barns. And he said to his soul, suke it says, soul, you have, you, have, you have it made basically. Live, eat, drink, be merry, you've got it made. And Jesus says, that the Lord said to him, you fool. Today, the Lord desires your soul. And he says, this is how it will be for the one who's not rich toward God. See, if you don't have a thing, you can still be rich to God. Rich. And, and, and I don't say that to say that things are wrong. It's better to have some things like food and clothing than to have none. You know? You give it all of your stuff away. Well, I want to be spiritual and follow the Lord, so I'll give all my stuff uh, to you, and now she has all my stuff. Now, I'm okay with God, but she's got to go and give all her stuff to somebody else so she can be okay. See, it's not the, the stuff is neither good nor bad. What is bad is if I don't have God in my stuff. The guy didn't have God in the barn project. The guy didn't have God deep down in his soul. And when you have stuff, by stuff, it can be relationships, your kids, your career, whatever it is, and you use it to the glory of God, God blesses it. I mean, it's, it's, it's being used for a greater purpose. Amen? Amen. I'm stoked about the Super Bowl. I, I tell you, I was, it was, I call it, but before Harbaugh came to coach, I call it the dark ages, because I was not a wimpy fan. Every game, I kept believing, and I would text my daughters, believe, believe, and uh, today I got a text from Allie, and my firstborn, that's A. She said, I've been waiting for this day to come. Go Niners. And then I got a text from B, Brittany. She says, I know. I woke up thinking the same thing. Then I got a text from C, Courtney. Uh, uh, no, Brittany said, she works in a homeless shelter all night. A Taurus is her job. And she said, I've been dancing around the shelter all night long in my Niners shirt. And then uh, Courtney says, I know I was thinking the same thing. So I heard from ABC. I haven't heard from Zach. He just got them playing, and he's still grieving. You go through a grieving process with you. But I'll hear from him. So we've all been celebrating and having fun. And I'll text him today while it's going win or lose. But the truth is, it's just a cotton-picking game. But what we are involved in, in the kingdom of God, will never end. But I say, let's bring it. Just bring it. Don't, don't hold back. Bring it! Bring it! Just throw yourself out there. Well, what if I blow it? You will, but don't hold back. Go risk again. You, you have a precious soul. Keep throwing it out there. Bring it. Give it up to God. Will you give it up to God? Jesus doesn't ask you to be all churchy. He says, give it up. And you and I can say, take my life. Every day, get up. Take, sometimes I get off track and start living for Stan. I go, yeah. Stan needs to get back on the cross. Jesus, take my life. 
take my life. And you can do that right now. If you're burdened now, you can offload that burden. Jesus promises you that he'll lift you and he'll refresh your soul. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that there's more to us that meets the eye because we live in a world that focuses on the eye and the physical and the temporary and we can get beat up or we can feel inferior, um, not measure up. Uh, but you have taught us that our, our inside is more important that, than the temporary outside. And Father, I thank you that um, you, you gave us this soul and that you help us in our soul to love, to be lovers. Help us to be lovers, to love you, God. Help us to not hold back today. Help us to unload. Jesus, we're coming to you, and we want to ask you to help us to take this burden. We want to offload it onto you because our soul needs rest. Refresh our soul, please, Lord. Take our life, Jesus. We give it all to you in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship God. How many times have I turned away? The number is the same as the sands on the shore. And every time. You've taken me back Now I pray you do it once more Please take from me my life And I don't have the strength To give it away to you Please take from me my life And I don't have the strength It's time to pray for our offering. Hey, let's do that again. Now it's time to pray for our offering. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we celebrate because we want to be radically free. And uh, thank you for teaching us about being cheerful givers. And life is not just about being consumers, but making a contribution. If there's anyone here, Lord, that's going through financial hardship, um, are not able to give, help them not to feel worried about that in, in any way, shape, or form. And help all of us here to give our hearts not try to buy you off, but to give our hearts and our talents and our gifts to your glory in any way we can, to be servants. And I ask for our giving to grow, Lord, so we can be a force of hope on the ridge and beyond until Jesus comes, and I believe you are able to do that, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building relationships that last forever. Building relationships that last forever. How do we do it? 
Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Next week, we're going to talk about loving people. Till then, remember, in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here. Find some soul rest. quick announcement um next week we won't be here that's the good news now (laughs) no um actually uh the youth band that we have now in place is going to be playing next week so it'll be nathan and uh will will be the oldest youth there but uh (laughs) he's still a youth all the same anyways go niners yeah right uh go niners (laughs) have a great week